just a quick intro about myself. Um, I've been in software for a little over 20 years and uh, 15 of that's been spent in, in healthcare um, and uh, other, other industries, but primarily healthcare. So I do, uh, am currently a director of engineering from cloud services at Space Labs Healthcare based out of Snoqualmie, Washington. And uh, that's probably enough about me. So if uh, you don't mind, Jeremy, I will share my screen. So before we get into the load balancing, auto scaling and, and getting into the console, I was just gonna give a quick overview of ECS for those that are not familiar with it. So what it is, is it's a managed orchestration layer for, for your containers um, that provides both, you know, uh, orchestration of, of servers via EC2 or serverless via their Fargate service. Um, one of the great things about ECS is that it, it can natively integrate on AWS with other services such as Route 53, um, your secrets manager, or excuse me, that should be a systems manager um, for different things. Um, your IAM, um, CloudWatch, and AWS App Mesh. It also allows uh, the flexibility. So within a cluster on ECS, you do not, it's not an all or nothing. You don't have to uh, put everything on EC2 instances and nothing on Fargate. You can choose what is most appropriate for your workload. Um, so the benefits of ECS, uh, one, there is the serverless option. So you, it supports Fargate to provide the serverless compute for containers. And this removes the need to provision and manage servers. So with Fargate, it's uh, you pay for what you use. <laughs> And uh, it, that's a, a real benefit there where uh, you don't need to have to provision and manage those. Um, application first with capacity providers. So capacity providers allow you to um, provide a strategy for how you want to deploy your resources on an ECS cluster and really as it says here, the demands of your app determines the co compute capacity allocated to it. So you can mix and match EC2 and Fargate with this as well. It's also taking advantage of a spot uh, with uh, taking advantage of spot pricing in addition to on demand. Uh, performance at scale. Key services at AWS uh, are powered by ECS. Um, I'm sure the Corey could probably answer what all of those are. I'm not familiar with, with all of them, but um, really you can launch you know, thousands of containers really rapidly using ECS with no additional complexity. It is a, a very secure service. So you launch containers into your own VPC that allows you to use your security groups and network ACLs. And you can use IAM to restrict access to services from containers. ECS runs across 69 AZs across 22 regions. And it's backed by their compute SLA that guarantees 99.99% uptime. It is optimized for cost so Fargate of EC2 spot instances realize up to 90% discounts compared to on-demand pricing. And you can mix spot with on-demand and reserve. Uh, another thing I'd point out here, and I think it's another slide later, but um, ECS is a free service. So you only pay for the compute resources you use with that. Uh, there's no additional cost to it. So how does it work? Well, uh, you have the Elastic Container Registry, which is essentially, a, it's a Docker registry like hub.docker.com. Uh, you have a private registry for your account and Elastic Container Service will pull images 
from that registry. And then within that, you define your application. Uh, and you do that, as we'll see in the console, using task definitions uh, along with uh, your service definitions. So there's a couple of steps there. But then you have the choice with your application how you want to launch that. Do you launch on you know, EC2 servers or do you go serverless with Fargate? And then ECS will scale your application and manage your containers for availability. So one thing I thought I would address is, uh, you know, Kubernetes is a, is a hot thing right now. So why not use Kubernetes? Because we do have EKS, Managed Kubernetes Service, on AWS. And one of the biggest ones for me is that ECS is just simpler, period. It's simpler to learn, it's simpler to manage, and it's simpler to deploy. Uh, EKS, or, whereas, or Kubernetes itself, has a requirement for a master node, and your cluster will stop functioning if you lose that node. This is not the case on ECS. It does integrate natively with other AWS services uh, that I mentioned earlier. One of the biggest ones there that I see is around the security aspects, being able to use your IM where you can define uh, roles that allow you to limit the access your containers have to other AWS services. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no additional cost for ECS. However, there is uh, a 10 cents per instance hour for each EKS cluster. So it costs you a little bit more. Uh, okay, then why would you want to use Kubernetes or EKS instead of ECS? Uh, really, the there's only two reasons I can find. Um, one is compatibility. So, for instance, my company is doing a big a big push right now for a new cloud native next gen platform, and we're going to we selected AWS as the provider. And we're going to use ECS for that. Uh, we do have an on-prem component. Uh, we chose not to use Kubernetes because of the, the master node. Uh, you have to have at least two nodes on this Kubernetes. So because of the master node uh, issues and requirements for running a Kubernetes cluster. However, with Kubernetes, you get compatibility. So with that, if you used EKS, you could take the same type of, say you're using an infrastructure as a service such as Terraform, that's you know provider agnostic. Uh, you could deploy your Kubernetes cluster on Azure if you wanted, or AWS or GCP or, or even locally on prem. So it is portable. And then two, uh, Kubernetes can support a higher number of running pods or, you know, AKA containers per EC2 worker because of how EKS uses the Elastic Network interfaces. So as we'll see, and what this means is um, we'll see in the console, when you define an, an ECS task um, or, or service rather, you have options for how you want to do the networking. And you have your typical ones that you have with Docker, your bridge networking mode, and your host networking mode. However, there's an additional one that AWS offers called AWS VPC. That's available and limited inside your VPC and is uh, typically the fastest method of networking for ECS. However, with ECS, by default, your each ECS host is limited to two AWS VPC services because of the ENI restrictions. You can get that increased, or you can do other things such as use a bridge mode for some services and AWS VPC for others. So that's really the end of those slides.
Uh, I wanted to add, just open up for any questions before we get into the console. If anybody had anything, you know, feel free to speak up. If not, I will just move on. Hey, Mark. Sure. Yes. I have a quick question. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on what challenge your organization was having that led you to using ECS. Okay. So one thing that we had was uh, kind of back in the day before Kubernetes existed and all that stuff, uh, we were doing deployments, you know, Linux servers uh, via RPM packaging. And so we had to manage an RPM, our own RPM repository. And, and this was on AWS, um, our own um, EC2 servers. We had to do all the management of that itself. Um, you know, upgrades had to be managed in a, in a very kind of non-optimal man manner. Um, and, and once, you know, Docker became available and ECS was available, it allowed us to automate a lot of that stuff. And it took away the management that we were having to manually do or, or script ourselves and allowed us to use that managed service and it saved a lot of time, man hours. Uh, I don't have it, you know, exact numbers, but you know, whereas it might take several hours to do a deploy. Previously, I could do a deploy on ECS in ten minutes. You know, it doesn't take long at all. So that's that was the biggest benefit um, for that. And additionally, the ability to um, to do the auto scaling and the load balancing where it's all integrated with ECS that was a big a big driver as well. So before, what we were doing was we were using HA proxy to for load balancing, and then um, there there was no auto scaling, so it was really non-optimal and ECS allowed us to do all of those things in a very seamless, integrated and cost efficient manner. Does that uh, answer your question? Awesome, that's perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any other questions? Hey Mark, I've got a question, uh, this is Terry. Um, one thing I wanted to clarify when you're talking about compatibility is, um, you know, as I understand it, you know, the, the ECS will run, you know, any OCI compliant um, container image. So I guess that part is the same across, you know, the two, you know, EKS or ECS, but am I understanding correctly when you say that, you know, the difference is that if you wanted to use like Terraform or another infrastructure management tool, that you wouldn't necessarily have the, the same level of support from from an EKS instance that you would for ECS. Is that correct? Um, that I'm not the best person. When I talk about compatibility, what I'm talking about is, is the tooling. So the tooling would be the same if you were doing, say you had kind of what I'm facing now where you have a, a, a hybrid deployment where you have certain services on-prem and certain services in the cloud. So the tooling would be the same. So your pod definitions and things of that nature mm. would be compatible with each other because you would be using Kubernetes in both places. So ECS, uh, unless you're using, uh, I think it's called Outpost, um, you know, ECS doesn't exist on-prem. So that's what, uh, you know, that's what I mean by compatibility. Gotcha. Thank you, sure. Can, uh, can everybody see the, the console I have open? So, uh, you know, it's Corey here. I also wanted to share something uh, just because sure. of the, the question that came up. 
Um, so one that was a that was a great response as far as compatibility. I just wanted to make sure that from <clears throat> the standpoint of Terraform, I heard Terraform get brought up in the conversation. Uh, typically, um, where Terraform comes in, it, it it's just provisioning infrastructure. So right. when you're talking about compatibility, uh, Terraform has the the ability to provision you know, infrastructure under the AWS platform, whether it's EKS, ECS, um, or whatever service you may be leveraging. But that is solely just infrastructure as code. Um, that is a separate a separate layer of compatibility, right? Where, uh, you know, I think, you know, where you did a great job answering the question was, you know, compatibility from a Kubernetes standpoint or from a container standpoint was really about just the run times and the, the um, the frameworks that you're using. So, you know, being able to have some synchronization between on-prem and the cloud from a logic perspective and a framework perspective and the entire control plane experience makes it easier when you're, you know, leveraging EKS on-prem and then moving that to, to AWS. Um, however, you know, when you're talking about Terraform or any infrastructure as code offerings, that is a separate layer of compatibility that that isn't related to the service itself more so just you know provisioning or standing up an instance of that service right not the actual yes, running and management that of the is service. correct and cool. i i failed to to point that out so thank you corey i appreciate yeah, that thanks for clarifying that absolutely but, but 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 great job great great uh this was actually great um you know customer story you know just you know talking deeper about the problem you're solving i think you know, a lot of customers have faced a similar issue that you have uh, you have been able to solve. So kudos there. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so with with EC two, I mean, excuse me, ECS. Uh, you know, you you need a VPC to start off with. Um, I have already defined, and a, a friend of mine is that I helped build this out for has taught, you know, graciously let me use. His. So um, just to very briefly, you know, best practices on your VPC with your subnets, you know, you want public and private. So all my ECS resources are going to be in the private subnets where my ALBs are going to be internet, the internet facing ones will be attached to the public subnets. So just here I've defined two for each uh, in two different availability zones. Um, now, one thing that really bites people sometimes is, okay, I've got my subnets and I've deployed something in my private subnet. And wait, now I it can't talk to the internet. So with your default VPC, that's not a problem because you have an internet gateway associated with it. And so you always want your internet gateway associated with your public subnets. Okay, however, for your private, what you need is a NAT gateway. And the NAT gateway is what is associated in your route tables for your, um, for your private subnets. So you can see here I've got you know, my local 10 dot CIDR address and then the NAT gateway. And that's going to provide my outbound internet connectivity from the private. Okay. Uh, just for the sake of time, I've, I've defined a lot of this already and I just want to go over it. Um, so for accessing Bastion server running in a public subnet, uh, secured by my security groups. And then I've got a single ECS server. Now, one thing I, I will mention is when you're using ECS, AWS provides ECS optimized AMIs. So um, if you build your own AMIs and you want to use ECS, I recommend that you start with their base AMI. Um, it's a, they do have a, the older Amazon Linux one AMI, but uh, they do provide the Amazon Linux 2 ECS optimized AMI, and that's what uh, I'll be using. And so that has been 
that's just a standard server. There's nothing special about it. Uh, and taking advantage of the new Graviton processors, which is a wonderful thing. Thank you, AWS. Um, and then we're, we're going to need a load balancer to be able to access our resources on the private subnets. So to do that, we need a couple of things. We need target groups and we need a load balancer. So my target groups here, I've got both the back end and the front end. And you'll notice when you're creating these target groups, you have different options for how you're going to connect to it. You have instances, IP addresses, and Lambda functions. Now, I mentioned previously about the AWS VPC networking mode. The only way you're going to get that to work with your load balancer is to choose the IP address type. Is when ECS deploys it, it is going to assign it its own IP and it will auto register it with the load balancer for you. So you don't need to do anything special for that. But if you choose instance and AWS, AWS VPC networking mode, it will not work. So we've got two of these defined here. We are gonna use the AWS VPC. Um, and then we've got the load balancer provisioned as well. And I'll quickly go over the, um, the listeners. So I've got, you know, my default 80 port, just redirecting that my TLS endpoint. And then under here, what we have are various rules. So those that aren't familiar with an ALB can see how this works. So when I want to define a rule, I give it a condition and I can choose, uh, typically I use host header, but you can choose path or some other header, or source IP, whatever you like. And then you choose an action. Um, when you're using target groups for your ALB, what you wanna do is choose forward to, and then you have a number of whatever target groups you have assigned that are created, excuse me, that are available and then you can assign it optionally a weight. And then you can provide stickiness as well. So if you'll see here, I've got, uh, this is a, a beta service for uh, a buddy of mine, and I've got a number of uh, universities that are connecting here. And those point to the production front end target group and then I've got a number of back-end addresses and then of course my Maven and Jenkins and then you can, you also have a default route on your ALB that you can do various things you can redirect you can do things I just uh, give it a 503 because I want people to know that hey it's not available all right, so that's really the infrastructure that I need. I needed my VPC. I needed my EC2 server, because I'm not going to be running Fargate on this, because I want to be able to, to shell into it and look at logs and things like that. Uh, and I didn't have time to set up CloudWatch and all that other kind of stuff uh, for the Fargate. So we're going to use that. Now, um, we will go over into ECS. Now I've got a cluster here. When you create a new cluster, you have a couple of options. Networking only, uh, Linux plus networking, where you can create uh, servers at the same time as the cluster or uh, a Windows networking. And I've done a Linux cluster. So under the cluster here, I've got three services. And how those services work is they are all created by a task definition. 
So I wanted to look at that briefly and show you just kind of how that looks. So let me see, let me just grab the uh, container definition here. And let's just go through a, a clean one. So let's say I'm gonna use EC2, I give it a name, test. And then here I have, this is where the IM integration comes into play. So you have two different things. You have a task role. So this allows you to make API requests to authorize AWS services. And then you have what's called a task execution IM role. Now that is the role, these are separate, because uh, this is a role that is required to allow ECS to pull container images and publish container logs to CloudWatch. So for this one, I'm gonna use my backend role, network mode, which is uh, AWS VPC, and you'll see the little warning here that they will share an ENI. Um, and when you do this, your Docker config is a little different. The container ports um, are specified, but host ports are not. Okay. Because what happens with AWS VPC is ECS assigns it a dynamic port and then it will, when you select the ALB, it will um, associate that port directly with the ALB so you don't have to worry about it. We'll just give it some memory and one CPU. And then here we, um, we add our container definition. So I give it my name, my URL. Um, I added task and CPU memory above, but you can also add hard and soft limits here if you want. Um, let's give it the same, 2048 for a hard limit. Now, since I chose AWS VPC, my only options for here are a container port. I don't have a host port mapping because that will be done dynamically. Um, here you can do a health check where you can provide a, a shell command and you can give it intervals and timeouts where it'll do a health check for you. Um, with this, I, I don't use this here because I do health checks for my ALB, <laughs> but you might want to or, or might want to do it yourself um, using some other method. And these are your, your typical, uh, most of your typical Docker type things. So you have your working directory, the command to run, all that's defined in my uh, Docker file. So I don't have to worry about that. Now with here, you have environment variables. Uh, this is a spring application. So I'll give it a, a profile, production. What I did test, I'll do test. Uh, the other thing here is while these are static, you can give it a key or an arm um, here. So if you give it a key that's in AWS System Manager's parameter store, then ECS will fetch that value for you and inject it into your runtime. That is uh, handy for things such as, uh, whereas you don't want to, you want to save all, let's say your database username and password, you want to save that encrypted using your KMS keys in the parameter store. Well, you just specify the key name here or the ARN and ECS will pull that and dynamically set it as an environment variable for your container. Uh, I have my networking stuff and then storage and logging. So you have mount points, volumes, uh, log configuration. You can 
chooses to auto configure your cloud watch logs and it will go ahead and add these things for you and publish those logs to cloud watch. Most of this other stuff is just um, Docker stuff. So I'm not going to go over that. Of course you can add labels. And then, so we got that. And then under here, you have some other options for your tasks and you can add multiple containers here. You can add an uh, elastic inference. You need that for like deep learning stuff. You don't, most workloads don't need that. You can add specific placement constraints, okay, to where you want to put your tasks, uh, the services associated with your tasks. And then a, a cool thing is uh, Elias App Mesh. So uh, those that aren't familiar with App Mesh, it's an Envoy proxy that lets you easily monitor and control your microservices. So it standardizes how those things communicate with each other, giving you visibility in the end and shows you high availability. So when you select this option, um, you'll, you'll get a mesh. You have to go create this in App Mesh. Uh, and we really don't have time to do that. But what will happen is when you configure this um, at mesh, you'll get two containers running. You'll get an Envoy proxy and you'll get the container that you defined. You can set up the proxy configuration for at mesh here. Uh, you can also add fire lens to it. And, and this is really, these things, these features are where I was getting at that you don't get with EKS. So you can do a lot of things in ECS that you just can't do with ECS. And really that creates the, uh, the service definition. Now, there are other options that you can add. So, you know, review the AWS uh, ECS task definition documentation because you can set things uh, like certain uh, container parameters uh, that you may need for things like uh, if you needed to do certain debugging, uh, native debugging within the container or something like that. I know uh, for running um, like uh, certain like heat dumps and things like that. You know, sometimes you need to add a little extra, extra stuff, and you can get that through JSON. So let's, if you look at the, you can see Linux parameters. You can add custom parameters for your Linux. That's that's what I was thinking of. U limits and all that kind of stuff. You can do all that in JSON. So the UI is not the only option. It is the easier one when you have a pretty cut and dry definition. So here I've got my task definition. And what I can do now is I can create a service. And these are required. So one thing your task definition needs to match your launch type. So if I define it as a Fargate task, I can't set up a launch type of EC2 and vice versa. Here you, you choose your task definition and the revision of that. You choose your cluster and I'll give it a name. And then you either have, you know, your replica or your daemon. Your daemon only maintains a single copy of your task on each instance. Um, replica will do all the tasks that you want across all of your resources in your cluster. Give it the number of tasks, uh, minimum healthy percent and maximum healthy percent. <sighs> Excuse me. So what this is, is when, I, when I've got a service running, and let's say I need to make a configuration change or I've got a new Docker image I wanna to add to it, and I create a new revision of my task definition. Now I want to update my service. 
Well, ECS will automatically, once you tell it to go, it will start the process of deploying that depending on your deployment type, whether it's a rolling upgrade or you can do blue-green deployments by using code deploy. So what this does is when it says minimum healthy percent, um, let's say I've got five tasks or in my, or I've got five services, one service with five um, number of tasks in it is what I'm trying to say. ECS will make sure that there is always five running as long as there are resources available in your cluster. Now, under the scenario where I said we're gonna update, okay, what this does, the maximum percent, what this would do is allow ECS to deploy up to 10 tasks. So it can do this rolling update. So it would start with the resources available and it would start deploying new instances of that new version. And then once it reaches either the total number it can, or if it's limited based on the resources, then it will start declining the number of the old tasks and it will start killing those off so that it can deploy back up to your threshold of healthy percent here. I mean, it always tries to do the total. Um, and then the other thing with min minimum healthy percent is, let's say I set this at 50 and this at six definitions. What that minimum is gonna also do there is say, okay, well, it's still gonna be considered healthy if three of the six are running. <laughs> All right, uh, you've got a, a number of options for how tasks are placed within your cluster. So AZ balance spread spreads the tasks across availability zones. Uh, if you cross multiples or within the same availability zone, it spreads the task across instances. And you can see the strategy here. Uh, you have a number of these and I think, I wanna leave time for Q and A so you can look up how this, all these work in the documentation. And then you have tasks uh, or tagging. Okay, I'm missing something. Oh, I didn't. All right, so here is where you get into the, let's see, load balancing. So I'm gonna get into here. And I'll give it my other private, no, that's public, my other private. We'll just let it have a security group. I don't want to, I don't want to auto assign a public IP because the ALB will take care of that. Now here I choose my load balancer and that allows me to select a grace period. Let's give it 30 seconds. Here's my load balancer name. I choose one of those. And then I add my container port to that. Now I've already got some target groups here. So I'll just select one of those and it will auto populate my listener port, my health check and all that stuff. And you'll see here target type is IP. That is because I chose uh, IP on my target group, which was required to use the AWS VPC. Uh, there's also service discovery, where you can use Route 53 uh, that'll create a namespace for your service, so you can discover it via DNS. And this is really all you have to do with the load balancing. Once you have your load balancer configured in your target groups, you just select the um, port, the whatever port you exposed for your container. Now, one thing to note is if you have multiple containers in your task definition, okay, uh, and so you've got multiple ports exposed, 
you can only associate that that service with an ALB via one of those ports. Uh, now we get into auto scaling. So I think most of us probably know there's auto scaling associated with EC2. Uh, it's a little outside the scope of this talk, but you really want to do that in conjunction with this. So if I want to auto scale this, it's pretty easy to do. I just tell it my minimum number of tasks I want. My desire, this is what I set earlier in my service definition. I'll say maybe my minimum is three. My maximum would be 12. And then this just says, hey, you know, you're giving permission to do auto scaling. And then you have a couple of options here, target tracking or step scaling. And there's different options for each one. So with target tracking, I just set a policy name. I choose a metric. I can do request count for target memory or CPU. I give it the value and then I give it my cool down periods for scaling out and scaling in. I can also disable scaling if I want. Now for step scaling, again, I give it a policy and I choose an alarm. So I have created one CloudWatch alarm. It's for disk usage, which is not useful for auto scaling, but this would be a CloudWatch alarm. And then same thing with your scale in policy. And, and that is how you configure auto scaling for ECS clusters It's very similar to how you do it for EC2 instances. And once that's done, I hit create and it will go and deploy that. So if I look underneath my services here, I can choose my task and it shows me all the tasks running for that cluster along with the revision of the task definition. It shows me what container instance, what basically in my case, what EC2 instance it is running on. And then if I check my task, it provides me with some additional information. So if I click here, it'll take me to the EC2 page where I can see what it's running on. It shows me our role and then you know tags and things of that nature. So another thing is I have this shows you all of the instances and then you have metrics associated with your container. Um, I think the, the last thing that I wanted to mention about ECS is let's say that you have a container excuse me, a cluster, and you need to add new resources to it. So how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, say I need to add a new EC2 server to my cluster. Well, how do I associate it with an existing ECS cluster? That's what I'm trying to, to say here. So what I would do here is I would say, this is state, or excuse me, lots more like this. And the way you do this very quickly is on this instance details. If you'll go down here under user data, this right here is the key to associating an EC2 server to a cluster. You just put this data, the ECS cluster equals and the cluster name into this file on your Linux servers. I don't use Windows, so please don't ask me how to do it on Windows. Um, and with that, I think that covers everything. And I'd like to open it up for any questions anyone might have. I have, I have one question, Mark. Would you mind uh, talking a little bit about 
um, app mesh. I know you mentioned uh, enabling it. I'm not sure. If, I think you were using it. Um, if you have used it, would you would you mind telling the, the audience about what Lyft it provided and, and how it helped, uh, oh, sure. you know, with, with your architecture? Yeah, so the great thing about app mesh is that when I deploy it on app mesh, um, I can specify, I can deploy new versions of my service side by side and app mesh allows me to route to each of those individually based on a load. So let's say I have, let's say I want to roll out a new feature on service A. Well, I've already got service A running. Okay, so I can deploy a new service, service B that has my, you know, shiny new feature. But let's say I only want it to show up for 10% of my users. App Mesh allows me to do that. It allows me to say, okay, it, it provides what I think it's called a virtual router. And so App Mesh will allow me to say, okay, send 90% of traffic to service A, because I only want a little bit of that traffic going to service B so I can verify it in my, in my environment. And that's the main, that's the huge benefit that I see from App Mesh. That in it, you know, the communication, uh, it kind of simplifies that between the containers. Um, but that, that is the big thing that it was for me with App Mesh was that I could be able to roll new things out and I didn't have to roll it out in place of the old. I could roll it in side by side and, I, and App Mesh would allow me to define how I wanted to roll that out based on on you know percentage of traffic and things of that nature so i didn't have to do that manually thank you appreciate that and, and also to add um you know that's one very common uh benefit of app mesh but but for those in the audience um as as mark already stated Right, App Mesh acts as a virtual router, so you can almost look at it as, as almost a proxy that sits in front of compute that may run in different platforms. So as he stated, you may use EC2 behind your containers, you may leverage Fargate um, in a serverless model, uh, but App Mesh allows you to have that front door between a particular segment of services, right? So that in his case, whether he's deploying a new version, he has visibility from a networking standpoint of how traffic is orchestrated to all the different platforms underneath his container orchestration environment, right? And when there comes time for forensics or errors or just general, you know, networking or ops uh, duties, App Mesh does make the visibility uh, a lot easier for admins to be able to pinpoint the root cause of an error uh, as well as just to handle any sort of traffic during a deployment as well. That's right. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, there is, I believe, a small cost to App Mesh, although it's not very much, if I remember correctly. I don't know, luckily I don't have to deal with the billing. <laughs> you know, I just architect and stuff. So, so App Mesh is actually, uh, App Mesh is actually um, free. So it's similar to ECS, right? Where you pay for the services underneath. Yep, so the App Mesh service itself is completely free of charge for customers. Oh, perfect. But it okay. is still good that you're not in building though. So you still don't have to worry about it anyway. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I only have to deal with billing when somebody says, this costs too much, get it lower. And then then it's my then it's my problem. Mark, uh, um, can I ask a question, please? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Sergey Markin. So my question is, uh, what about like scheduled tasks? So for example, I have a task to run, for example, daily, but uh, it's like a bit too long to run it, like a lambda, because lambda has like like short uh -huh. limitations. And uh, I would like to run it like serverless, like a Fargate, for example and okay. using like spot options because I don't mind like interruptions and something, but still, uh, is it like, uh, you know, doable, possible, and what would you do if you had something like that? Uh, that, you know, I've never come across having to do that. Uh, I know there's ways to, to, you know, you can bring things up and down at will with 
with EC2 with Fargate. Uh, I'm not sure. Now you can start and stop tasks using the CLI. Corey, is there a way to schedule a Fargate task to start and stop at a specific time frame? Yeah, absolutely. So what we can do is typically a pattern we see is customers leverage CloudWatch events or the CloudWatch scheduler. So what you can do is, um, you know, the same way you can interact with tasks through the CLI, you can just use the CloudWatch cron scheduler, whether it's going to be, so let's say it's a static time, then you can just use the CloudWatch cron scheduler to, you know, for scheduling the task and you can just author the, the logic with a Lambda, right? And you can just, you know, have logic that will run at that point in time to either start or stop a task. That's one way. Um, other than that, I mean, that's pretty much the, 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 the most common way. I mean, whenever there's some sort of event driven logic, the, the most common pattern is CloudWatch events or the CloudWatch scheduler. So if you're waiting on something to happen in the platform, maybe data is moving around, or maybe there is a, a different resource event you're waiting for that will start a task. You, you know, we could use that event itself to be the asynchronous invocation point for you starting a, you know, container task. Or if you wanted to just statically run it at the same time every day or week or just at a point in time, you can always use the cron scheduler within CloudWatch and then you can inject the logic that would, you know, start whatever ECS task that you have um, mm -hmm. within CloudWatch. Great. Great, thank you, Corey. No problem. Thank you. And uh, uh, my, my, my second question is like uh, about auto scaling. So if you have like uh, EC2 instance, right? And your instance uh, in this example was like pretty big. And uh, how does it work if a uh, number of tasks, uh, for example, during the day, so for example, I need to scale up to like 20, uh, instances of this task, so it's a Docker containers, and they do not pretty much feed the instance you have. So will it scale? Just it will it add more EC2 because like EC2 has like some sort of like capacity. For example, it, it runs like up to ten tasks. Uh, no, no. Uh, th this is what I was I was saying. You know, the EC2 auto scaling was kind of outside the scope of this, although it is similar. <laughs> Uh, you need to use them in tandem. So the thing with AWS EC2 and ECS is that EC2 auto scaling is, it is separate than ECS. ECS is just for your services that are running on your EC2 infrastructure. So you need to use auto scaling groups on your EC2 instances to scale up as needed. But if you try to auto scale an ECS, service and you don't have, and you're not using Fargate, you're using EC2, but you don't have the, the compute resources, it won't work. Thank it's you. not going to just deploy them for you because it, it doesn't know how. But it will work in the Fargate case, right? Fargate, yes, because Fargate's serverless. Thank you. And that is also one of the biggest benefits of why, you know, we invented Fargate was, you know, based on customer feedback, we realized that customers were really good at running the applications, but they didn't really want to spend too much time on managing the pods underneath their uh, container orchestration system. So Fargate, again, gives you that ability to just specify the run times and will provide the compute, the warm compute environment based on internal business triggers that allow us to continually feed you compute. But if you're taking the EC2 option, then you're taking on that responsibility of the underlining infrastructure that would need to be available in the event that your application did scale up, right? You'd have to make sure you had available capacity that was configured because to Mark's point, the service needs to know uh, which infrastructure and how it's configured in order to leverage it. So it wouldn't just arbitrarily pick EC2 that's available in the platform. One, from a cost standpoint, that could be very uh, detrimental for a customer because then you wouldn't have control over your application. Your application could basically just spin up resources um, based on whatever triggers if you're running an EC2, right? So in that model, again, we give customers a little bit more control 
uh, just, you know, whether it's based on comfort or, you know, maybe the customer is just not, um, the application may not bode well with the serverless paradigm. Right. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're we still got a, yeah, we but we still got a few more questions. If anybody that's uh, just you know no, come to the group and wants to time. ask a question, yeah, so they can yeah, get 20, they can get their twenty five that we were going to do at the end. You know, everybody ask a question and get twenty five dollars Uber Eats. So anybody, we've got three more. If we want to get three more questions out of folks that are still here, um, I have a, besides Serge, Serge, you you won the yeah. first one. <laughs> okay, uh, so the question is. Uh, could you please uh, describe more the situation using like Spot uh, and Fargate together? Because, you know, for creating like, uh, easy, so I can create like EC2 in, in a Spot, so I'll create like mm -hmm. load balancer, oh, sorry, out of scaling group with the like Spot uh, allocation and everything. And in this case, yes, I can use it, but this is actually like, is to do things. But what about like like lambdas? They never go like spot. But Fargate and spot, this is like really good option. So I can run, for example, my long, like hour long or two hour long scheduled tasks in Fargate and like save some. Save some money, yeah. It, it works the same way as the EC2, you know. Uh, it's spots based on availability. So the only thing about spot is that you know, it's, you're not guaranteed that it's going to run it because there may not be spot available based on what you have requested. That's the only downside to it really um, is that, you know, there's got to be availability for what you're trying to run versus, you know, doing a not an on demand where, you know, it's, it's almost always there. Although <laughs> I have run into cases where you know, my region has run out of, you know, M5 XL servers before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, but my most of the question is like, how is it to like configure a Fargate to be like spot? So okay, just cool. just like a couple of yeah, like let's, options. Let's take a look. Uh, and I'll just go through it real quick. I'll okay. move on back in here. And I'll show you. I also sent the link to the chat as well for folks to take a look at. Um, this is actually going to run through exactly what Mark is doing. So it'll tell you more about the spot integration, what the differences are, and just the ease of, the ease of use of how you can, you know, configure it to be Fargate spot as opposed to um, traditional Fargate yeah. as well. So remember this with Far with Fargate, I have I cannot choose EC2 as requires compatibility in my task definition. I have to choose Fargate. Now with this, the task size becomes different. With Fargate, you choose your memory and your CPU. And AWS has been very helpful here and said, you know, based on the number of CPUs, let's say I want to get half a CPU. Um, then it'll tell me also the right memory ranges is one to four gigabytes. Okay, I'm gonna have to edit this because I gave it a lot more. So uh, memory, let's say 1024 megabytes. And this was for the CPU, the 12. And that's done, okay. So I'm creating a, a new one here. So you can create new task sessions too based off old ones by just giving me another name. So this one will work with Fargate. Uh, let's see, Fargate, oh, source path. Yeah, because I have my logs. So let's get rid of that. My bind mounts, because I don't have those on Fargate. And get rid of this. And there we go. So now if I want to create a Fargate service, if you choose the platform version, uh, I always choose the latest when I do Fargate, but you know, you, there may be something specific in the release notes you need. Uh, tests, Fargate, number of tasks, one. And you have basically the same types of options 
But let's see, where's the... Uh, Where is it? Well, geez, where did it go? Where, where's the spot to do a spot for Fargate? The capacity provider. Uh, oh, up. that's right. Capacity provider. Yeah, custom strategy. I have to add one. Well, I, don't, I don't have one. That's right. Okay, so you, you do a capacity provider. Um, this is a relatively new feature, I believe. Yeah, it is. So with Fargate, the only thing that changes, as you'll see in that the blog post that I sent, is the capacity provider, it just changes to Fargate spot, right? So instead of it just yes. being the typical Fargate, um, he, he just have a custom capacity provider. So all that would mean is on the back end, AWS would leverage warm compute from the spot compute, which means that it may be ephemeral by nature, right? It may get relinquish back to the public but as far as the way you set up your clusters and your tasks that piece remains the same you're just changing yeah. who's providing you that compute That's so right. switching from fargate to you know the fargate spot or creating another fargate spot uh back to cluster would be no more added complexity than a traditional fargate cluster the only thing again is just making sure your application can withstand uh a interruption and in processing because again you know that two minute warning may kick in where that compute may be relinquished back into a pool of on-demand compute so then you would not have that to run your spot fleet anymore absolutely that, that is a, an excellent point so if you have something that's essential that completes you, you don't want to use that fargate spot yeah, yeah. thank you very much uh, just a little, little just question about like uh, availability of the spot. Anything special with the E zone in US East one? Because it never has any spot at all, just never. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, I, I, I totally missed the question. Can you ask that? Availability zone E in US East one just never has spot. So everybody, all other like five zones have this spot and this one never has any spot options at all. Is it anything specific about that? Like, well, I think it, it's more dependent on not so much the zone, but the, the resource, if you're talking EC2, you know, there's not gonna be a, as much spot for every resource type. So there might be more for a T3 micro than there is for a M5G or M6G Excel. Yeah. Um, as far as Fargate, AWS is, is going to provision that based on the task CPU and um, when I chose Fargate and I chose my um, my uh, CPU and memory for the task that's how it's going to know what to do. So we're, when I did my task deployment, um, let me get back to that. Here it is. And I gave it the task size. And that, that's how it's going to know. Um, and it's going to choose, you know, the right infrastructure for it. Honestly, um, I, I don't know a whole lot more about how it makes that distinction. Uh, I think that's probably a trade secret there, but uh. <laughs> yeah, it's a mixture. So the, 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 the easy answer is based on the workload in that region is the first way we determine when spot capacity is available and how much, uh, whether it's spot EC2 or Fargate uh, spot. Um, so it really depends on that region. Uh, as well as the workloads running in that region. For example, you may have, you know, reserve capacity. Um, you may have some capacity allocations from other customers, right? So we pull first from that spot fleet because it is an ephemeral compute platform by, by nature. So it really varies just based on what's running in that region as well as, you know, how, you know, internally with the service team divvies out. From, a, from an availability standpoint. So there's really no uh, standard or hard 
requirement for how much will be available at any given region uh, versus another region? Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we're up on time and uh, everyone um, is uh, just, it's just a few of us here. So we'll just go ahead. Okay.